Heather here. Her name is Heather Appleby. I'm not sure where Heather just ran off to, but uh, she may be back in just a little bit. Um, so a big thanks to uh, Richland College for having us out and allowing us to use their facility. Um, this is going to be the first in a series of beginner astronomy classes that, that will be, I guess I should say, I will be teaching throughout the year. There will be other guests that will come and give presentations. Um, this is my first presentation ever on this kind of <laughs> subject, so uh, you'll have to cut me a little bit of slack. I want this to be very casual and interactive. Um, if you have any questions, comments, if you feel that I've said something in error, that's fine. We're all amateurs here, except for Heather. I don't, I don't think it's your first presentation. <laughs> very relaxed and professional. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I spent many years in corporate America giving presentations there you and go. documents and things <laughs> like that. Uh, but I'm no longer there, so uh, that's why I've got the ponytail now. <laughs> but anyways, um, tonight's class is going to be a very brief, uh, well I say very brief, it's going to be about an hour, maybe 45 minutes, about just telescopes in general and uh, the different kinds, um, what, they, what they are, what they do, why would I want this telescope over that kind of telescope, and just a brief, a, a small amount about buying telescopes. I'm not going to go into uh, great detail about that, but we're just going to talk a little bit about that to begin with. Okay, so here we go. <coughs> the first type of telescope that we're going to talk about here is called a refractor. And um, anyways, all right, so what we have right here is called a refractor, and um, the light just goes straight through it. If everybody remembers the old pirate telescope, this telescope out, which by the way is where we get the word telescope from, um, you'll see that the light just comes straight through and goes out the back. Um, this particular type of telescope is really good for planets or high magnification of brighter objects. So a refractor might be really good for looking at the moon because it's very, very bright. Uh, you might look at things like uh, Saturn or Jupiter. Uh, planets are generally very, very bright. I mentioned uh, Saturn and Jupiter because they're large. Other planets like Venus and Mars are kind of small. And so while you can use a small refractor to view them with, uh, you would need a very large refractor to get much detail on Mars. So again, this is just a, this is probably your most basic telescope. That's not to say though that professionals don't use them. In fact, um, I find that, I say professionals, I, I guess I should say uh, amateur astronomers that are very serious and have deep pockets. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, we'll move on to the next type. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry, here we got a diagram uh, of our refractor telescope. And basically you can see that in this diagram, it's very, very simple. Light comes in the end and goes out the back. <laughs> and you put your uh, eyepiece there and uh, it brings the image into focus. So there's no mirrors or any, anything terribly fancy. You just have an objective lens in the end and then you have your eyepiece here at the other end. All right, so let's keep going here. All right, he's got some flashlights for us, excellent. Okay, did you get a flashlight? I've got one. Oh, you do, okay, no problem. Let's see what I'm gonna do. I think I'm going to, I think I'll just take this little one right here. He's got a really nice flashlight here. This is good for astronomy because you can, this one got the red, yeah, it's got a red light on it that's variable. And so when you, when you don't want to ruin your night vision, when you're looking at your, your star charts, you can use this very, very low light and it's a, it's a variable one. Anyways, we can talk about that after the class if you'd like. The next type of telescope uh, that we're going to have a look at here is called a reflector telescope or a Newtonian. And the reason that it's called a Newtonian is that uh, it was uh, invented by Sir Isaac Newton. Um, back in his day, uh, they didn't have very advanced optics. In fact, I believe uh, most of the mirrors in these things were mostly uh, polished speculum metal. Does that sound right to everybody? Yes. And so today we have much more advanced mirrors. Um, we have something called a first surface mirror. We're not going to go into great detail uh, about what that is, but uh, just understand that it's radically different from your bathroom mirror. And with your bathroom mirror, the, uh, you go through glass and then there's a silver part on the back. Whereas on a first surface mirror, the silvering is on top, and so it has a profound effect uh, on the quality of the optics. So uh, basically, um, we have an example of a Newtonian right here. Uh, this is a um, this is a Newtonian telescope, and um, I don't know if any of you can really see this very well because we're kind of you're, it's okay if you need to stand up. Um, they're very very simple. There's one mirror in the bottom, and then there's another mirror in uh, the very end here, uh, near the objective that bounces light into the, uh, into the eyepiece. So light travels usually in parallel ways. Um, <coughs> Heather can probably talk a lot more about that than I can. But um, typically light will come in 
to the end of the telescope. On most Newtonians, this is just empty space. This is air. So yes, dust can get in here, so we usually keep them covered. There are some special Newtonians that, that do have a seal in, but uh, we're not going to be talking about those tonight. Uh, but at any rate, the light comes in. It'll hit a concave mirror. It'll bounce back up off of this flat mirror, and then it will bounce back up into the eyepiece. So uh, you've got some, uh, some folding of the light here and then uh, bouncing back in. If you'll notice, there's a significant difference in the visual appearance of a, of a uh, refractor and a reflector. With the refractor, you'll notice that the eyepiece is located at the very end of the telescope. Light enters the front and comes out the back. With the Newtonian, however, light will enter the front, bounce off the back, and then you'll see this eyepiece sticks out of the side, usually near the front of the telescope. And so the orientation of the eyepiece is, is very different. So you can quickly tell just by looking at a telescope uh, on the outside which kind it is, uh, whether it's going to be a, uh, a refractor or a, re a reflector. Okay. So you'll also notice that the reflector has no glass uh, lenses in it except the eyepiece right here. And the eyepiece will have But This is a mirror right here. It's usually a polished glass uh, plated with aluminum, as is the secondary mirror here. And you'll notice that that secondary is at a 45 degree angle. Uh, some people call that a diagonal mirror. It is, it is, but there are other types of diagonals that we'll talk about in a second. So does anybody have any questions so far about the difference between a refractor, which refracts light, and a reflector that reflects light? Okay, good, 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 good. All right. So we're going to move on here a little bit. All right. We talked about a reflector or a Newtonian. One of the most popular types of Newtonian telescopes is called a Dobsonian or a Dob. It was invented by jo Don, uh, John Dobson, who I believe was a member of TAS. Is that right? Yes, yes, he was actually a member of our club. <laughs> and um, I, if I understand uh, what, what John was after, he wanted to make it easy for everybody to have a telescope that was uh, functional and worked really well. And um, he did a great job. Uh, it's also really good for people that like to build telescopes because all it is is uh, it's a Newtonian that sits on a rocker so they can go up and down. And you have a lazy Susan at the bottom. So it's not terribly difficult to build one of these on your own. Um, and um, they're ultra portable. You know, they're, they're, they're mostly empty space in the middle. Uh, the one that we have here is, of course, a mass-produced one by Orion, but this whole tube is hollow. Uh, this exterior is made out of some kind of uh, lightweight metal alloy. Uh, we have a mirror here in the bottom. The secondary is, is right in there, and then the eyepiece just comes out the side. So you can see that it looks, the optical tube looks very much like this one, but this one is on a tripod, whereas this one is on just a cradle with a Lazy Susan at the bottom and it moves in an up and down motion and side to side. So um, these particular types of telescopes, because of their ease of use, are very uh, highly recommended for beginners. Um, also, one of the great things about the, uh, the Newtonians and the Dobsonians uh, specifically is that um, they're usually pretty low cost. Um, they, uh, you, they have a reputation for having the best bang for your buck. Because these uh, Refractor type telescopes have to have glass that is, you know, made just right. Um, the process is, is a lot more tedious uh, for making uh, lenses. Also, you'll notice that this this telescope has a lot is a lot smaller uh, the diameter of this telescope, and um, part of the reason that you'll see that is that as these these types of refractors get bigger and bigger, they get extremely complex to manufacture. And uh, because of that, they cost a lot of money. Whereas with a reflector, they're relatively inexpensive to produce. So uh, it's a lot easier to enter the telescope market uh, with a reflector or a smaller or a smaller refractor. It's just up to you whichever kind that you find um, is best for you. All right, does anybody have any questions about the difference between a daub, a refractor, or a reflector, or anything like that? Okay. Are the reflectors good to do? What's that? What are the reflectors good to do? Um, a reflector is pretty much good for everything. Um, I, I would say that a lot of people are going to use them for deep space objects. 
um, as opposed to a refractor like this over here where um, you can still look at deep space objects through a refractor but uh, you'll find that um, they're generally better suited for things like uh, planetary viewing, um, looking at the moon, um, brighter objects in the sky. What do you mean when you say deep space objects? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A deep space object is uh, going to be something that is like a, a nebula or a galaxy or something like that, and typically those objects are very faint. Um, a planet is reflecting sunlight, um, as is the moon, and so they tend to be very, very bright. Uh, in fact, um, when Venus is up, it'll look like the brightest object in the sky, uh, uh, excluding the moon and the sun, of course. Uh, so, um, so yes, you will see, in fact, because of the difficulty in manufacturing a very, very large uh, glass lens like you would have in a, uh, in a refractor type telescope, most people, when they want to buy a really, really, really large uh, telescope for looking deep into space, they're probably going to use something like a Dobsonian. Um, there are several manufacturers that make um, very expensive <laughs> Dobsonians, but their refractor counterparts would be several orders of magnitude more expensive. So, uh, like for instance, with this humble 8 inch um, Dobsonian that I have here, I'm able to take it out uh, under very dark skies and see some pretty faint objects. Um, typically speaking, the larger the diameter, um, the more you can see, uh, the, the darker the object may be, um, and the, the easier you may view it. That's not necessarily true, but as a general rule of thumb, that's the way it goes. Also note, this particular telescope right here has a small hand controller on it. It does not move the telescope, but it is what's called a push tube. And uh, whereas mine has absolutely no electronics on it whatsoever, doesn't require any batteries, um, this telescope doesn't require batteries, but if you do connect it to a power source and align it properly, it will help you locate objects in the sky. I personally think that this, this particular type of Dobsonian is really good for people um, <coughs> as a beginner telescope, especially if they can afford the extra electronics, because you can use it either fully manual with no power, and once you get comfortable with that, then you can uh, plug in the hand controller and have it help you locate objects. It literally tells you, point the telescope a little further up. Okay, now go a little to the left, a little to the right. And then once it uh, tells you that you've hit your target, uh, you look for the eyepiece and it'll either be there or it'll be very close. Okay. Did that answer your question at all? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Now we're going to get into this other type of telescope. Um, some might consider this telescope a combination of both a refractor and a reflector. I do. I personally do. Um, this telescope right here, uh, this display here, is an Orion Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, very much like the first type of telescope that we talked about, which is a refractor, light enters the front and comes out the back. But what goes on inside is a lot more complex uh, than just a simple <laughs> refractor. And so basically, as the description says here, light enters the front through a corrector lens, bounces off the mirror at the back, bounces back to a secondary mirror attached to the front corrector, and back out to the eyepiece. So that sounds a little confusing. So this is what we're talking about right here. So basically, let's see if I can get this guy tilted towards you a little bit, because I think that the visual will help a lot. One of the telltale signs of a uh, schmidt cassegrain is that it's going to have a corrector plate in the end of it like this. And this is a glass plate um, on the objective. Again, the light's coming in uh, parallel lines, and it passes through the corrector plate and goes back to this mirror. And you'll, you'll recognize this mirror. It's similar uh, to the, uh, the mirror that's in the Newtonian, although th these are typically spherical mirrors, and the ones and the uh, and a typical Newtonian is going to be a parabolic. Um, if it's if it's a if you see a Newtonian that has a spherical mirror like this, it's also going to have to have a corrector plate. But we're not going to worry about that tonight. I, I don't really want to focus on that. Um, but uh, just understand that just like the Newtonian, light comes in and it bounces off this what we call the primary mirror, and that primary mirror is going to be at the back of the telescope. Then the light is going to travel back towards the front of the telescope, but the reason it's not going to exit is there's another mirror here, the secondary mirror. So just like on the Newtonian, we had a secondary mirror there, but notice that the secondary mirror in the Newtonian is angled 
whereas the secondary mirror in a Schmidt Cassegrain is not. That's because it bounces the light right out the back. So you'll notice that there's a hole in that primary mirror there, and that really that's exactly what, what happens in this in this celestron right here that John brought tonight. There is a hole uh, right in the center of the mirror, and the light passes through the back. So just very very much like the the refractor telescope, we have the light that enters the front and it exits the back. But you'll notice that there's some significant differences here. Um, the refractor has just one lens uh, in the objective and then the eyepiece in the end. Whereas a Schmidt Cassegrain, the light passes through that front corrector, bounces off a primary mirror, reflects forward to a secondary mirror, and then goes through a hole in the center of the primary out to the eyepiece. Um, we call this particular type of instrument a cathodioptric. And uh, Wikipedia describes cathodioptric as a combination of lenses and mirrors, uh, a device that has both lenses and mirrors. I've also heard people um, mention uh, that it's a folded light path, but I haven't actually seen uh, cathodi I haven't seen a definition that I found today that said folded light path. I, I merely saw one that said that it was a combination of, of uh, lenses and mirrors. So this is a little bit more complex, but one of the wonderful benefits of a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, uh, telescope you'll see it uh, often abbreviated as SCT or uh, what people say a uh, cat. A cat, right, right. And uh, it it makes the telescope much shorter. If if this same telescope were to be a Newtonian, is this, do you know what the focal length on this is, John? I don't know offhand. Okay. It's that the one with the front is. Okay. About 23. Okay. 2300 millimeters. That's 2.3 meters. That's over two and a half yards. And so, um, can you imagine if John's telescope was two and a half yards long? So, um, you know, that's the benefit of folding this light path back and forth is that um, you can uh, make them much more um, compact. Also, a spherical mirror. Anybody that's ever made one knows that a spherical mirror is very easy to produce. Um, parabolic mirrors are not. Uh, it's a totally different process that you go through. So being able to put a sp spherical mirror in the back here and then correcting that aberration with a corrector plate is, is a little bit more cost effective. Um, also you get the benefit, this, this whole thing is sealed up. Um, he's, as long as he keeps the cap back here on the back where the eyepiece goes, there's not a lot of dust that's going to get into this telescope. Whereas with my Dobsonian over here, I perpetually have to be vigilant, keep the ends covered, uh, mirrors covered, things like that, especially if I'm going to be observing outside all night. They get a lot of dew. And you know what happens when things get wet, they attract dust. And then when it dries, the dust stays there. And so this particular type of telescope is very nice. Um, a lot of people really like the Schmidt Cassegrains. I think they're wonderful. Um, they do tend to be a little expensive because of the complexity of the parts. Um, you'll notice that there's a corrector plate. Uh, many, many times this corrector plate is actually matched to this mirror on some telescopes. So if you break the corrector plate, you're toast. <laughs> so um, also, when you remove the corrector plate because you're trying to do maintenance or get fancy with it or change something, um, it can cause a lot of problems. Uh, especially if you don't get it back on there correctly, uh, but still, it's, it's a very good um, it's a very good telescope uh, to go with. Um, okay, all right. Does anybody have any questions about the Schmidt Cassegrain? Oh, um, Eric actually brought his. This is another very very similar telescope. It's um, it's a, almost an identical configuration, but it's called a Muxatov Cassegrain. And the only reason that it's a Muxatov instead of a Schmidt is because instead of having this flat Schmidt corrector plate. Uh, it's a curved corrector plate. I don't know if it's hyperbolic. It's technically a meniscus lens. It's a meniscus lens. Okay, yes. So, but essentially, uh, this telescope here and this one over here, they're both cathodioptric. They both have a corrector plate, a secondary, and a primary mirror, and the eyepiece is on the end. So, um, so, so far we've talked about refractors, where the light just goes straight through, like the, the telescope that Joe brought us right here. Uh, we have a reflector. Usually people use reflector and Newtonian uh, interchangeably with each other. And then we have the Schmidt Cassegrain of the cathodioptric scope. And those are your three main telescope types. So now when you leave this class and you're walking somewhere with your friends and you see some 
some geeks like us uh, having a star party outside, you can walk up there and say, well, that's a very nice Schmidt Cassegrain uh, that you have, and you'll know what you're talking about. What's, what are they good for dealing for? Uh, Schmidt Cassegrains are uh, very good for all kinds of things, multi-purpose. Uh, they would be good for viewing deep space objects like nebulas, uh, star clusters, galaxies, that kind of thing. Uh, they would be good for planetary. Um, they would be good for lunar viewing. Um, you can get a solar filter for all of these telescopes, and you can look at sunspots and things like that. Uh, in fact, when we had the Venus transit back in June, um, there were about, what do you think, Joe, about 300 people out there, and we had a number of people that just brought their normal nighttime telescopes and just put a, a special safety um, filter over the end so that we could look at the sun and we could actually see Venus going in front of the sun at that time. So uh, I would say uh, schmidt cassegrain is very appropriate for everything. Um, they tend to be a little heavier, a little bulkier, um, and usually, uh, in fact, I've never seen one mounted on as simple a platform as this uh, Dobsonian right here. So you're probably always going to have it mounted on either a tripod or something that we call a pier. And uh, a pier is just a vertical column. Um, that's either uh, concreted into the ground or screwed into the ground or, or some kind of mobile solution. But they do uh, typically require a little bit more of a heftier um, uh, you know, platform to set them on. One thing I would say about the schmidt cassegrain is typically um, they have a lot of magnification. So if you wanted to look at an object that's really, really, really big, um, you might be more suited to either a small refractor or even binoculars. Um, Hugh was nice enough to bring a pair of his binoculars. Which ones are these, Hugh? Nikon. Okay, these are Nikon binoculars. Um, there are binoculars that are better for nighttime viewing and some that are better for daytime. Um, Celestron sells uh, some very affordable um, nighttime um, binoculars. But, you know, honestly, just about anything can be used. Uh, we may have another class where we talk specifically about binoculars. Um, but, uh, uh, we'll go into this just a little bit more, but I would say that probably if you're on a budget and you just really can't afford, you know, a telescope or it's just too difficult to cart around, uh, a pair of binoculars is a wonderful thing. There is a large number of objects. Uh, in fact, the uh, the galaxy that is the closest to us, the Andromeda galaxy, is very nice to view through a pair of binoculars. Uh, there are a number of uh, star clusters and other objects in the sky that are really great. The, um, you mentioned earlier that you were working on one of those. Yeah, you can, you can do scavenging mass AI mm -hmm. uh, for the first level just to get it in more for the second level. That's right. What she's talking about is the Astronomical League offers uh, different awards uh, for keeping records of different objects that you have observed. And that um, the Messier catalog is a catalog of 110 deep space sky objects. And you can see, obviously, 70 of them with these binoculars, which is very amazing. Uh, so before you go out and, you know, drop 3,500 or more on a brand new Schmidt Cassegrain, you might consider uh, just a simple pair of binoculars. I will say from personal experience that I prefer to use binoculars on a tripod. Um, if you've ever tried to use binoculars, you know they're, they may be difficult to stabilize. I have a horrible time trying to stabilize binoculars, so it's much easier uh, to set them on a camera tripod. Um, many of them will come with a tripod adapter and or you can buy uh, other products that will adapt your, your uh, binoculars for you. And you can even start with just a simple uh, camera tripod. And uh, they make a number of uh, sophisticated uh, accessories that you can get for binoculars. For me personally, I would just move up to a telescope before I did that. But uh, we have a, a number of uh, members of our astronomical society that really love observing with binoculars. Well, it depends on what your yeah. your, your aim is. Yeah. I mean, if I'm not particularly interested in spending a lot of time yeah. fooling with gadgets because I spend enough time dealing with the computer for my work. So, you know, I want to look at stuff yeah. and I want to do it as fast and as easily as I can. And that's what binoculars are able to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've heard time and time again, and I say this myself, is the best telescope is the one that you use. You know, a lot of people go out, and I've, I've talked to a number of people that said, well, gosh, I just can't bring my telescope to the star party tonight because it's just too hard to move. And that's fine. Uh, they're typically limited to their backyard uh, for that. If it's too big and it's too cumbersome to use, um, if you can put it in your car quickly 
there is a much higher likelihood that you will actually take it with you somewhere and use it. And binoculars can be left in your glove compartment. And, and my goal is to not to look at the sky and know what I'm looking at. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm not at all interested in a machine that does that for me. Right. Right, yeah. I mean, if you really want to learn the night sky, um, it, it, it's hard to do it if you have a computerized telescope mount that does it all for you. Right. Uh, you can type in the object and find it quickly, but um, you're not going to learn the night sky very well that way. I have, I have all kinds, and I, I, I use them all for different reasons, and so it just depends on what my needs are. Uh, but I do find that time and time again, this guy actually collapses down, this Newtonian that's over here, and um, I can see a few of you that are craning your head. So let me just move this guy. And it's obviously, it's not very difficult to move. This part collapses down, and it allows me to put it in. I can take this optical tube off here. Oh, by the way, whenever you hear the word OTA in astronomy, that means optical tube assembly. And so in any of these telescopes, this is the optical tube assembly. Over here on the Schmidt Cassegrain, this is the optical tube assembly. And when we talk about OTAs, we only mean just the actual optical tube itself. Everything from down is usually, uh, you'd call it the mount or the tripod or, or something like that. I think I've heard people refer to this as a cradle for the Dobsonian. Uh, but again, uh, in theory, I can actually remove this telescope and by remove this optical tube assembly from this cradle I can put it up on scope ring and put it on a mount just like that. And so I could then turn it in from a Dobsonian to something else. Good question. All right, does anybody else have any other comments, questions, anything else they'd like to say? Comment All right. On binoculars. Oh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Comment on binoculars. Yes, sir. Great when you're doing those hour long exposures for astrophotography. Yes. It gives you something to do. Absolutely. Yes, and I, I can speak from personal experience. When you're when you're doing astrophotography, first of all, it means you're crazy and you're a glutton for punishment. Um, we have some of the finest, yes, and you're going to be going into that too. Yeah. Uh, John's just now uh, about to dive into the abyss of astrophotography. It's really fun, um, but there's a lot to it. Um, we have some of the, we have some world-class astrophotographers in our club. We probably have I would say at least one of our members, maybe two of them are in the top five in the world maybe, and maybe that's you know, in fact, John just had uh, two of his. Uh, three. Three? Oh my gosh, and was that it? Yep. And Jason Ware's publicly known everywhere. Yes. <laughs> yes, Jason Ware's been a member of our society for much, much longer than I have, and he sells a lot of his uh, work and posters and, and other things. So I've, I've actually seen his work around North Texas quite a lot, displayed on people's walls and in stores and things like that. So when you're doing astrophotography, um, of course, you're always going to be doing it during the winter because that's when it's coldest and the nights are the longest and, and they t tend to be clear. But you're sitting there in the cold and it's wet and you're tired and you're freezing your butt off. So what Eric is suggesting is that go ahead and take your binoculars and do some actual observing. Most people find that uh, their astrophotography needs to be automated. So the, uh, the um, binoculars free you up to, to do some actual observing while your equipment is, is uh, turning away. Okay. Now, you'll notice, let me back up just a little bit. When we look at this basic refractor design, you know, I talked about the pirate telescope earlier. And, um, you know, when I was reading about the history of telescopes, um, people actually had uh, objects that magnified things. Uh, and I think it took them quite a long time before they decided to turn them up to the sky and look. I think people just thought all there really was up there was a bunch of dots, white dots. You know, I don't know if they really knew that there was a whole lot going on up there. Um, and uh, anyways, because you've got your basic pirate telescope that's like this. But can you imagine how difficult it would be to observe like this? And, and what if it's on a tripod? Well, think about how high up that tripod's going to be, and you're going to have to stand underneath it. So it's, it's horribly not ergonomic. It's very uncomfortable. And uh, I don't really know anybody that looks straight through a telescope like that. It's, uh, it would be very difficult. Um, so you're going to be using something called a diagonal. And I mentioned this earlier. You see on the back of this telescope right here is a little 90 degree angle object that takes, you know, the, the light path is traveling in this direction and it takes it and reflects it up into the eyepiece. That means if you happen to be looking straight up or what we call zenith, 
when you look, you'll be looking straight and the telescope would be pointed straight up. And you'll see these star diagonals on telescopes like, typically like a uh, refractor or a catadioptric telescope. It's not necessary on the Newtonian because the eyepiece is already fitting perpendicular to the optical tube. So it's already okay. I mean, it, it, it sometimes is a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but if you get the right chair or the right step ladder, um, it'll, it'll be fine. But uh, you do not need a diagonal on a, um, on a Newtonian or a Dobsonian. But you will almost absolutely need one uh, for a, a catadioptric telescope or a refractor. So what exactly is a star diagonal? Or I'm sorry, a diagonal. People call them uh, star diagonals also interchangeably. All it is is uh, the light comes in out of the back of the telescope and it either passes through a prism or a mirror and then comes up into the eyepiece. Over here on the right, I've got a couple of examples of what a diagonal looks like. Um, if you buy a refractor or a schmidt cassegrain grain, they may come with one, they may not. But even if they do, it's likely that you're gonna wanna buy your own. Um, so just understand that you know the diagonal is necessary um, for the viewing angle to be comfortable. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? About that viewing angle? Okay, all right. So with diagonals, there's gonna be a couple of different kinds. Um, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna look at a website to, to buy a diagonal and you're gonna be confused. You can pay anywhere from, I've seen them as low as $40 for a new one, up to seven, 800. I mean, you can pay any amount of money that you want for, for a diagonal. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what they actually are. And uh, the first type of diagonal is probably the one that you're going to want to buy, uh, depending on what you're doing. And that's just there's just a mirror in the bottom. In a in a mirror diagonal, this this element right here is just going to be a mirror. So the light's just going to bounce off of that mirror, and it's going to bounce right up into the eyepiece. And um, that's what I would recommend. Um, I have not seen a mirror diagonal that was other than a 90 degree angle bent. Has anybody ever seen anything else on a mirror diagonal? No, I don't. I think that there is there is only a 90 degree angle uh, option on a mirror diagonal. Um, when you look through a mirror diagonal, the image will be right side up, but it'll be mirrored left to right. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So it's it's just like when you look into a mirror. You know, your head is at the top, your feet is at the bottom, but you know, right is left and left is right. The, the image is, is, is not the same as, as, as the real image that you would view with your naked eye. Now the prism, on the other hand, has a number of options. Uh, it may be, I've seen prism diagonals. This element right here would be a piece of glass and it would be a, a glass prism. I have seen them that can be 90 degrees, they can be 45 degrees, and I've also seen some that are at 60 degrees. Um, it just depends on uh, what you're looking for. Uh, if you're doing a lot of terrestrial viewing, um, you may want the, the 45 or 60 degree because it's unlikely for terrestrial viewing that you're going to be looking at zenith or straight overhead. More likely your telescope is going to probably be parallel with the ground and a 45 degree angle of view is going to be much more comfortable for you. Um, they can be right side up but mirrored just like the mirror diagonals but they may also be what's called a correct image diagonal. What that means is, is that up is up, down is down, left is left, and right is right. Everything looks, is in the same orientation as it would be with your naked eye. So if you are doing terrestrial viewing, um, you don't have to flip the image in your head. There is a downside though to using a prism diagonal. Um, Let's see, I, I have some notes here. Let's see if I can tell you a little bit more about what those downsides are. Typically, what it deals with is loss of light. You're going to lose light, and you may have some optical aberration. And so typically, the quality is not going to be very good. Um, if you're looking at the moon, or you want to see Saturn's rings, or you're looking for terrestrial objects, a prism diagonal is just fine. I own one. I use it for terrestrial viewing. I also use it for lunar viewing uh, because the moon is so incredibly bright. Um, the kind of viewing that I do, I don't need a tremendous amount of magnification. And uh, when I'm looking at a lunar map and I'm looking for craters and things like that, I don't have to turn the map upside down or flip it in my mind or anything like that. 
So the correct image diagonal is nice um, for everything looking as it should, but you pay a price for it. Uh, you will have less, it says right here, transmitted light is less and can have optical aberrations. That's for terrestrial and or low power. And the reason I mention low power is you'll find in your telescopes, uh, as you change out your eyepieces and you get more and more magnification, your image will become darker and darker and darker. So at lower power, things are a lot brighter. Uh, this light loss is less of an issue. All right, does anybody have any questions about star diagonals? Okay, we're gonna go a little bit further into the different types of mirror diagonals. And I only mentioned this because I said I would help you <coughs> buy things. And uh, we've got, um, I don't, there's three different kinds. I don't think you'll find any that are uncoated anymore. Um, originally, the mirror diagonals were uncoated uh, aluminum and, uh, or other, other things they would tarnish. Um, you're gonna lose 10% or more of your light that's reflected through there. So if you're trying to look at a dim object, uh, that could be a problem. A much better option is, is pretty much everything you're going to see in a mirror diagonal today is going to be it's going to have enhanced coating. Um, it's going to be approximately 97% reflectivity. Uh, I say that as a general rule of thumb, it may be slightly less depending on the quality. Um, the enhanced coatings uh, are usually they just have some special coatings on the aluminum to uh, uh, keep them from tarnishing and enhance some of the reflectivity. The very very best though. Uh, it's going to be your dielectric coating right here. Um, I don't really have any pictures to go with this because they would all look the same to you. <laughs> there wouldn't really be much to demonstrate. Um, but the dielectric is what I would highly recommend. Um, if you already have a diagonal that has an enhanced coating, don't go out and buy a dielectric one. Um, you won't notice the difference between 97 and 99% reflectivity. Um, unless you just have some really expensive equipment and you just want to buy more. Uh, I, would, I would not upgrade from an enhanced to a dielectric, but uh, if you're buying a brand new one, go ahead and get the dielectric. Um, I don't think you'll see too much difference in price. I recently upgraded to a dielectric, and uh, I was really impressed with it. I could definitely tell the difference. So does anybody have any questions on what a mirror, or what a star diagonal does, the difference between the mirror and the prism diagonal? Okay. All right. We're good on time. Okay, so we've talked about refractors, we've talked about reflectors, we've talked about catadioptric telescopes, and we've talked about the, the diagonals right here. Uh, what we haven't talked about is everything below <laughs> the optical tube, and there's not much to say. Um, there's two main kinds that you're going to see, and we're going to talk about this, the, the mount that this thing sets on. And the first type of mount is called an out as. Does anybody know why we call it an out ad? Why would we use such a weird word? The reason is because it, it's short for altitude and azimuth. Altitude is up and down, and they're in degrees. You know, it's halfway between overhead and, and uh, parallel to the ground is 45, straight overhead is 90, and straight out is zero. So when we talk about altitude, we're just talking about how many degrees off of the horizon is the object. Um, azimuth is just you know, how far north, south, east, or west. You've got a 360 degree dial, and uh, zero degrees is north, 180 degrees is south. So <clears throat> that's why we call it an out as mount. What you'll notice on the out as mount is, as you would expect, it moves either up and down, left and right. And I know that seems a little bit basic, but there are telescope mounts that don't do that and uh, they're a little bit more complex. You could say that a Dobsonian, you could argue that it is an out as mount because its motions are up and down with altitude, and they are left and right with the azimuth motion. And again, those are usually referred to um, in degrees, whether you have uh, how many degrees from the horizon is the object, and uh, the north, south, east, and west uh, would be the azimuth. The nice thing about them is they're very simple to use. Um, just pretty much look through your finder scope. You move the telescope up, down, left, and right with your hand if it's a manual telescope, and, uh, and you find the object. And most of us as kids, this is exactly what I had right here, only mine was a me, and it looked almost identical to this. <coughs> um, the downside to it is there's no sky tracking. Um, as objects 
move in the sky, they, they move in different circles and different arcs. And this thing does not move in an arc. It moves at right angles, up, down, left, and right. So as you're tracking an object across the sky, you are moving both up and down and left and right manually. And uh, that's fine for some people, and for some folks it's not. Um, on the more inexpensive telescopes, these tripods can be kind of weak. Um, I go to star parties a lot where people bring inexpensive telescopes, which is great. Uh, I encourage everybody to bring whatever they have out. Uh, but they, they, they're flimsy, and sometimes as you're moving them uh, and then you let go, then the telescope continues moving or it flops around. And you pretty much have to find every screw on this mount and tighten it as much as you can. Um, the other thing is, down this last bullet point, it says image may shake at high magnification. Um, if, if any of you have ever used the zoom on your camera, you'll notice that when, when you zoom into objects more, you have to hold the camera a lot more still. And the same is true uh, with these telescopes. As you may not notice that your tripod is, is shaky on lower magnification, but as you use a different combination of eyepieces and get more and more magnification, especially when you're looking at planets and things like that, um, you may just notice that it shakes constantly. And I, I have unfortunately owned telescopes like this. And so uh, when you're looking for an Altaz mount, you want to make sure that it's pretty sturdy. Um, both of these right here are pretty good. Um, you know, they're very sturdy. And uh, like Eric's here, it has a lot of places that you can tighten the screws. Of course, Joe's got a very, very nice teleview here. Um, and uh, I've personally used these. I don't own them, um, but they're extremely stable. But you just have to make sure when you buy one, especially if it's inexpensive, that it's sturdy enough to support your telescope. Does everybody? Uh, yes, that yeah. The obvious question. Yeah. I take it that the more expensive scopes have image stabilizers. I haven't mm -hmm. seen. No. no. I haven't seen a telescope. <coughs> no, not yet. true. Oh really? Never seen one with okay. image well, stabilization. There's simply an image stabilization. Mm -hmm. What you have is a bobbin. Must on there is a piece of uh, glass, and then. What occurs is, is it works on digital cameras because the sensor on the digital camera can send feedback signals to the bobbin to tell it how to turn that lens to keep all the light rays parallel or perpendicular mm -hmm. to the surface of the detector. That doesn't work in film because I don't have anything there that can give direct feedback. And if the scope gets larger and larger and larger, then the size of the coil to drive that particular piece of glass has to increase fourfold for every twofold increase in the size of the glass. After a while, the image stabilization becomes so extensive that for telescopes that are used for professional astronomy throughout the world, the image stabilization piece is the size of that desk right there. Yeah, yeah easily. Easily. Yeah. Where it comes in. The only other image stabilization I've ever seen, which we probably won't have available to us, is where the actual mirror itself is made of hexagonal inserts that are grouped close to each other, and they can warp them. In other words, there's multiple pieces. Right. Wow. So for yeah. binoculars and simple 35 millimeter cameras, no problem. I've yet to see a medium format camera with image stabilization, and therefore there's no telescopes other than professional observatories that have that. And we're talking millions of dollars. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. <coughs> but there are. You know, you, you got that kind of script? Let me know. I'm trying to. Oh you. no, I'm, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to understand what's possible. Yeah. You could argue, really, what a binoculars are is it's two refractors that are perfectly aligned with each other, so that they, they are perfectly parallel, orthogonal, whatever you call it. Um, and, and actually, I do see people that take all of these different types of telescopes and put them side by side and make massive binoculars. But the only, the only thing that we could afford that would be image stabilized that I can imagine that you might call a telescope is one of these. And so, uh, I don't know, could you, I guess you could argue that this, these are two refractors, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, they are two yeah. refractors. I mean, that's... That's exactly what they are. You have to be careful using words in front of a bunch of intelligent <coughs> astronomers because they'll... Thank you. They may not like the words that you use, but yes, I mean, um, they are. It's just, but that's it. I mean, you're not going to get on something like this or on John's SCT. Let's go back. That's, that's a very good question that you ask, though, but let's go back and look really quick. Um, like on this SCT right here, the only thing that could move to stabilize the image would either be this secondary or this primary mirror. 
So you'd have to have something that could move this fast, like thousands of times a second. Uh, there'd have to be all kinds, and then there would have to be an electronic eye in there to tell it how to move. And so uh, maybe someday we'll have something like that, but I don't, I don't think in our lifetime we'll have anything like that that the common person could afford. But that's okay. Go to McDonald Observatory or go down to uh, Chile or any of the places that have uh, the adaptive optics that uh, he was talking about. And I'm sure they'll be happy to show it off and, uh, and it won't move. So, um, you know, generally speaking, if you're, if you're on firm ground and people aren't stomping around your telescope, it'll, it'll, be, pretty, it'll be pretty good. The only thing uh, that you can't really control is the wind. Um, although I have seen people with portable observatories, they kind of pop up. And they circle around uh, the uh, telescope, and they knock off a lot of the uh, a lot of the wind. So um, there's a lot of things that you could do to stabilize it before you um, broke the bank on trying to invent uh, the image stabilization. But that was a very good question, though. Okay, so let's see. Um, where were we? Okay, so we've talked about the Aldazamel. And did anybody have any questions about that? Or yes, yes, Lloyd. I was just going to say, you know, technically. Of course, there are sky tracking Altaz mounts. Absolutely, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, now, I mean, the LX200 and the CPC are exactly that. Yes, in fact, um, Eric's telescope here, the uh, ETX125. Yeah. Right. It's a uh, must stop caster grain. It is computerized, and it will track objects across the sky. Right. Um, once you dial in an object, uh, it, well, I say it will track it. It does not intelligently track it. It just moves the telescope based on some calculations, it moves little motors in there, and it, and it does its best to move with the sky. Um, I think that what this bullet point mm -hmm. here talks about no sky tracking is, is um, when you have a telescope like, like uh, John's telescope here, uh, we'll get into this in just a minute, and I'll explain why, um, what that bullet point means, but Lloyd's right, that is a little bit misleading. Well, I mean, that one obviously doesn't, but there are some that do. That's right. Yeah, you're... Your manual out as telescope mount cannot do any kind of tracking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, objects in the sky move in arcs, and an out as mount moves up, down, left, and right. It does not move in an arc unless you manually do that. That type of telescope, this type of telescope mount, very obviously moves. I'm going to be very careful here. But this thing moves. <laughs> Is everything okay? Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. So we got our out as. Now the next type of mount that we have is called an equatorial mount, and um, John has brought his LX55 EQ mount, and this is an excellent example of what an equatorial mount looks like. Now I'm going to remove this just for a second. You hung it on the wrong spot. Okay. okay. Sure. 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 No problem. Um, you'll notice that this is a little. There we go. So now this one's. A, I hope everybody's not blind. <laughs> this one's a little bit different. You'll notice that this one kind of swings left and right, but it's not parallel to the ground. And we also have this other funky motion here that moves in a circular fashion like this. So it's very different from Joe's Al Daz mouth over there that moves up, down, left, and right. If uh, you're used to thinking in up, down, left, and right, and you try to use an equatorial mouth, it could be very confusing to you. But here's what's great about an equatorial mouth, especially if you like manual mounts, the only thing I have to do is, once I get my object centered in the eyepiece, assuming that I have the mount properly aligned, all I have to do to follow an object is move this one motion right here. And see how it moves in an arc? It'll follow those arcs in the sky that all the objects move in. So it's very nice. Once you get your object in the eyepiece, all you have to do is slowly move this in one um, one motion and it'll track those objects in the sky. Now that is also dependent on you setting up this mount properly and I'm not going to really go into a whole lot uh, about how to do that but basically this thing is going to point, this axis right here is going to point right at the North Star and let's pretend that this is the North Star. The whole sky rotates around that one star and all the objects are, are moved in concentric circles out from there. So when we talk about polar alignment or equatorial alignment, what we mean is, is this axis right here is perfectly parallel to the uh, pole, uh, the, um, the, the uh, north and south pole that runs through the planet. So anyway, um, they're just, there's just different ways of doing it. Um, there are also, a lot of times, serious observers will have these dials 
that, that tell you how you're pointed and those dials will have uh, markings on them that will correspond to a star chart and you can very quickly look at a star chart and dial in um, you know the uh, the appropriate coordinates and you'll be either on your object or very 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 close um, without this type of mount um, even if you had those same dials on something like this um, you would need a computer to tell you the altitude and azimuth of an object at any given time or you'd have to do some crazy math so um, you know there is quite a bit of a difference between the two uh, my very first purchase um, was was a mount almost identical to John's it was an LXD 75 um, in, in function they're identical in fact the only difference I can see by looking at it is that uh, mine is um, almond colored and his is charcoal um, it was too much uh, computerized, equatorial alignment, polar alignment, that was too much for me. I really should have, I, in fact I would have enjoyed this a lot more and this would have been a lot cheaper. I think I, I think the one that I bought, I bought it on eBay, my first mistake. <laughs> you know, you buy used optics off of eBay, you don't know what you're getting. I got the thing, it was broken, I had to fix it before I could use it. And then I took it out in the backyard and it was a while. It was, probably, it was probably a couple of weeks before I could even remotely figure out how to use it. And you know, a lot of people are just going to give up. <laughs> you know, put the thing in the closet and forget about it. Um, something like this is, is so much easier. You know, you see that, that bright spot in the sky? Okay, well that's Jupiter. So I'm going to look through my finder. Oh, there, my finder says I'm right on Jupiter. I'll look through the eyepiece and man, what do you know? There's Jupiter. That thing, two weeks to find Jupiter. <laughs> it just depends on what you're after. Um, if, if you're just really mechanically inclined and you like a good challenge and you like to spend money go for it um, you know I, I personally uh, wouldn't think the average person could do that uh, but to each his own you know my advice is to get something that's just like this or something that's like this um, that's just you just move it and go um, let's see can be polar aligned have some have a polar scope built in what that means is um, there's actually a, a little telescope in here that helps you to get this thing aligned. You take off the front, you take this off, you rotate the tube, and I can look and make sure that Polaris is what I'm pointed at. And uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to um, to get it mounted. We're not going to talk about polar alignment in this particular mm -hmm. class, but if you have some questions <coughs> about equatorial mounts or polar alignment after the class, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, it makes a lot of sense, it's very logical, but it takes a little while for all of this to sink in and it's really good to, to bite off small chunks of this stuff and try not to process too much all at one time, otherwise it kind of it kind of boggles your mind. The nice thing about the equatorial mount, however, is that if you start off with the manual one and you do get it aligned properly with, with uh, you don't really align it with the north uh, with the north star, but it's very, very, very close to that. It's actually something called the celestial north pole, which is just a few arc seconds, I guess, or is it a few arc seconds away? At any rate, um, once you get this part aligned, I'm not talking about the telescope. I'm talking about the mount itself has to be aligned specifically with the sky. Once that happens, most of them you can add on a, a simple clock drive. A lot of them are battery driven and it'll track your object across the sky for a very long time and that is one of the benefits again once i get my object locked in to the eyepiece and assuming i have my mount all i have to do is move in this direction right here like let's say i've got my object in there i'll just keep moving a little bit a little bit a little bit and that's because of the rotation of the earth well what a clock drive does is it counters that rotation of the earth and i've seen a lot of people with very inexpensive clock drives and they put them on there there's no computer involved. Usually they're battery driven. They're very simple. It is absolutely impossible to put a simple clock drive on one of these and get it to track across the sky. That has to be done with a computer because this thing does not move in arcs. Not, not naturally anyway. So like Eric's out as mount, of course now he's put it in an equatorial mount. <laughs> which is actually, I'm kind of glad he did that because he has two different possibilities here. Eric may, uh oh, yeah. He may use it as an out as, or he can use it as an equatorial mount. He has that flexibility with this particular kind of mount, which is very cool. I think that I think that's very cool anyway. So that does mean that with this particular scope, he can unlock this right here, and once he finds an object in the eyepiece, 
call it, and this is fully manual. Even if its battery dies, its computer stops working, all it has to do is rotate it on this axis, axis to keep the object aligned. So that is very cool. I like that a lot. Okay. So if I've blown your mind, does anybody have any questions about equatorial mounts or Altas? You can kind of see that there's quite a bit of difference in the visual appearance of something like this and something like that. You'll notice that instead of having the up, down, left, and right, you have the what we call the right ascension, which is this movement here. You don't need to remember that tonight. And then you have your declination. And with this type of telescope, you have your altitude, up and down, like we normally think, and left and right, like we normally think. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, let's move on just a little bit. Okay, all right, we're just about out of time. I just want to go over a couple more things. Um, telescope mounts, fork mounts. Um, just what I just said, they can be polar aligned with a, well, he yeah. basically has a wedge that's built in. We're going to talk about what a wedge is here in just a second. Um, most of the time, if you want to take an Altaz mount, the kind that goes up, down, and left, and right, and you put it on this wedge, which Eric sort of has built into his mount, then it turns it into an equatorial mount. And usually you'll notice that the, that the equatorial mounts are, are angled. So if you do find yourself with a, a fork mount like this, um, and you would like to have it work uh, more like this mount works, then all you have to do is just buy a a wedge for it. Um, let's see, Mead and Celestron go-to scope mounts. Yes, um, this is this is a Mead. This is a Celestron. Uh, both mm -hmm. of these. What's that? That's a Mead tripod. That, that's a Mead tripod and, and mount. That's the Celestron. Oh, that's right. Celestron. I'm sorry. No. Celestron. Yeah, this is the Mead uh, LX55, and that's the Mead LX125. Mm -hmm. Typically, the optical tube and the mount is always going to be together. On that telescope, you can pick and choose how you want to do it. And thank you for correcting me. Um, let's see, usually an SCT scope is fork mounted. Um, John has his SCT scope on a uh, equatorial mount, and, and I see that a lot, but typically you'll see them, I believe this is an LX200, these are both LX200s, yes, and um, you'll typically see uh, SCTs mounted on, on fork mounts. Most of the ones that you'll see at Star Party are going to be on fork mounts. Is your Baoshen Lam on a fork mount? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. But he has his on a, um, with a wedge. Yeah. His has a wedge on it. And if we are fortunate enough to be able to observe tonight, depending on how clear it is, you may get to see Hughes, uh, Bausch & Lomb SCT. It's very unique. Um, they are portable and smaller sizes, out as without wedge. Now, they make these guys really small. This is the biggest one. This is the biggest ETX that Mead makes. This is the ETX 125. That's right. The smallest is the 70. And we're that has to do with the size, 125, 70, has to do with the diameter of the aperture in millimeters. So his, if you were to measure the, the aperture here, is 125 millimeters. Okay, so just got... Okay, so we're going to run through this last part really quick because we're pretty much out of time. Um, let's talk about this just a little bit more when you're purchasing a telescope. Because um, everybody's going to, of course, after this class, run out and buy a telescope, right? Um, don't do that. <laughs> Not just yet. Uh, I would recommend that you be patient. Uh, the more patient you are with a telescope purchase, the more satisfied you'll be. I think one of the most patient people I've ever seen is sitting right here in this room, and this is Hugh. Uh, Hugh has been very patient. He's taught me to be patient with purchases uh, for optics and for telescopes. Uh, do your homework first. Try to be patient. Um, use everybody else's scope. Come to Taz star party. Did you know that we have a star party somewhere in the Metroplex every single weekend, unless there's a fifth weekend in the month, and then there's not one scheduled? Yes, sir. Tomorrow night star party is in Frisco. Yes. Anybody can go to our website and find out exactly where and at what time, and I saw the moderator event this very morning, and it will happen tomorrow, unless weather is not permitted. That's right. If you, if you look outside and it's overcast, star party's canceled. Yeah. Can't see through the clouds very yeah, well. Buy another beer. Yeah, there you go. Um, I have here on this. Uh, yeah, cloud filters would be nice. Yeah. Um, right here, I have a, a, some printouts. Please take them home. Sadly, I've only got about ten of them. Um, so couples, please share. Um, on this um, sheet here is our. No, it's not. I'm so sorry. 
Taz brochures right here has our Taz website. On the home page, there is a link to our calendar, and it'll tell you where all the star <coughs> parties are, and you can also look there to see if they're canceled. Come to these star parties. Use other people's telescopes. That's what we're there for. Um, you will see telescopes ranging from $50 up to thousands. I mean, I've seen $20,000 telescopes at these things before. Um, so go and use these different types of telescopes. Ask a bunch of questions. Um, I would recommend a manual dob like this as your first purchase. That would be my highest recommendation. Um, you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, you're going to get the most uh, generic wide use telescope uh, that you can with this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's this thing called push to capability. It is not go to, it does not move the telescope for you, but it helps you point the telescope. It tells you move it up, down, left, right. Uh, when you plug in your object, but normally push twos can be used with or without power. Uh, without power, they work just like a manual telescope. With power, they would allow you to uh, electronically find the object in the sky, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, binoculars on a tripod are great for newbies and veterans alike. I know a, a lot of people that are what I would consider master observers, and they extensively use uh, binoculars. You can get them for really cheap, and they're very versatile, and you can take them everywhere. Avoid eBay unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> Please listen. Avoid <laughs> eBay unless you know what you're doing. Um, I've been a victim of that. I've known many, many, many people that were victims of eBay. What's that? Avoid Craigslist. Well, I, I actually... Unless you know what you're doing. I, I agree with Eric, unless you know what you're doing. The, the thing that I do like about Craigslist, and, and I have recommended Craigslist, I apologize, I think in a future slide here, um, but Craigslist, the thing about it is if it's local, you can at least go and put your hands on it and see what it is. If you do your research first on a given telescope and you say, well, dang it, I really want a 9-inch Celestron SDT, and you got yours off Craigslist, yeah. and I want it on a Mead uh, LX55 mount, and, you know, Fred, you know, two blocks over has got one, well, you can go over to Fred's house and you can look at it. Maybe you can even use it and find out what it's like first, and then you can buy it but uh, I certainly would avoid uh, eBay. Um, these websites, I have printed off over there for you if you'd like to take them. Um, telescope.com, who can't remember telescope.com? I mean, <laughs> it's as easy as it gets. That's gonna be the Orion Telescope website, but it's only Orion. Telescopes, plural, is Hayneedle's website. Um, yes, they are cheap. Um, sometimes they do handle their merchandise a little bit rough. I've had excellent, excellent luck with Hayneedle. Um, I've heard mixed reviews, but I personally have had really good luck with him. If you want the absolute rock bottom price, go to Hayneedle or telescopes.com. Um, but don't get them confused. Uh, Hayneedle will have everything. Orion will only have Orion. Opscorp.com. Um, they have a lot of really great telescopes. Now, they also sell some really expensive stuff, too. But what I really like about Opscorp is they have their own brand. I'm, this laser I'm using is an Opscorp brand laser. Bought it for $40, and it's one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, I would rival this against many hundred dollar lasers I've seen. Um, so yeah, their own self-branded is very good. Astromart, oh, that's your best bet right there. Astromart <coughs> is Craigslist for amateur astronomers. Um, Astromart, to kind of keep out the riffraff, they do charge a one-time $12 lifetime membership, and it is completely worth it even if you only ever use it once. Um, I have gone to buy equipment for astrophotography that the moment I went to buy it, it, it was discontinued by the manufacturer and the only place I could find it was on Astromart. And uh, it's, a, it's a close-knit community, um, people know each other, and just like with um, eBay, you can look at ratings, only these actually mean something. Uh, you can look and see the history of people and things like that, and uh, you, you can buy with a lot more confidence on Astromart because it is, uh, it's, a, it's a good community of folks that are trying to help each other. So highly recommend astromart.com. Go ahead and bite the bullet and spend the 12 bucks. Okay, uh, cloudynights.com. Do not buy things from cloudynights.com unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. But it's a wonderful international community of amateur astronomers that you can get wonderful information and reviews. You can talk until five o'clock in the morning with these people on the web forums about everything astronomy. And there's some fantastic people on there uh, you can talk to people in Ireland, you can talk to people in California, and uh, I don't know how many members they have, but I'm assuming it's in the tens of thousands, if not more. Um, 
Now, the last website here is the very the very best website you could possibly have. <laughs> it's telescopeman.tumblr.com. This is Joe Lalamia's website for weekly discussions about astronomy as a hobby, and it is highly recommended. Joe has some of the best no-nonsense videos out there that I have ever seen for buying telescope equipment. Joe has a wonderful ability, unlike myself, to be very short and to the point and only tell you what you need to know. And so, um, again, that's on that handout over there. Um, please go to Joe's website. Um, see, look at every video he's got before you buy it. If you Google Telescope Man, his website yeah. see, is one of the first, <coughs> the very first one. So just remember Telescope I Man. I got that name that pretty good on Google. Yeah, he does. So. All right, we're out of time, and I apologize for running over. It's my first time. I got started a little bit late. Hope it didn't bore you to death. Do we have any questions? that anybody's got about anything we've talked about. You want to know the meaning of life? Why are we here? What do you do? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Turkey. All right. Um, again, uh, thank you. Stuff before he got it right in the thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate everybody uh, doing this. What I'm going to try to do uh, with these future classes is kind of take this to the next level. Uh, I haven't exactly decided what our next topic is going to be. But it's probably going to be related to how to use a telescope and things like how do I know what magnification I'm looking at? What's my field of view? When I actually look through the eyepiece, what am I expect? What would I expect to find? And um, how do I find stuff? You know, how do I find those faint fuzzies? How do I find the Andromeda galaxy? So uh, I'd like to expand on that, uh, and that's probably what we'll talk about next time, and then we'll just go from there. I also welcome your recommendations and your feedback about anything you'd like. Uh, uh, for these classes to cover. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you.